Welcome back to Boom and Bust. I'm your host, Tony Clement, uh, chatting with Peter Deeb. He is the executive chairman of Hampton Financial Corp. Uh, Peter, uh, uh, talking about the broad brushstrokes uh, in the economy right now, uh, specifically the Canadian economy, uh, from your point of view, uh, you know, there's a, I guess, what do you think about our ability to compete and be productive in the world today? Are, are, we, are we meeting those goals or are they still uh, tough to meet for us? Look, I think Canada has always had very specific and unique advantages and very unique disadvantages uh, from a competitive landscape. And I think those remain constant over the last, say, 30 or 40 years. So I think where we are today, we can be competitive. Uh, our competitive edge has been supported by government uh, over the last you know, many, many years to help us stay at the, at the forefront. Um, but things are going to get more challenging. I mean, we are seeing the coming of age of China, India, Latin American countries, South America, uh, all of them, and Middle East and Africa, Africa now, uh, starting to really bubble to the top economically. They're really starting to make some moves. So uh, we're we are going to see a new competitive landscape, and we're going to have to figure that out for sure. Yeah, and I do want to talk about those uh, topics in one sec, but uh, since you mentioned government support, I do have to ask, obviously, the, the big story uh, has been the uh, Volkswagen EV a battery plant getting $13 billion in federal uh, government uh, subsidies. Uh, does this make sense? Is this what we're going to have to do to, to have uh, manufacturing in this country? Look, I think there's an awful lot of domestic industries that could benefit from a $13 billion uh, largesse of the government. Um, I, I, I really think this is speculative and political in nature and what they're doing here. I mean, congratulations to Volkswagen. Uh, for cutting a brilliant deal, but I, I don't see the return on investment for Canadian taxpayers on this. Uh, these type of facilities that they're talking about don't uh, are very automated. They don't create a lot of jobs. There's not a lot of uh, sort of broader upside to it. So uh, I, I'm afraid this was more of a political play than than something with economic fundamentals. Yeah, and I guess the the, the defense has been uh, that. Uh, it had to be done given uh, Joe Biden's uh, Inflation Reduction Act uh, subsidies that are found in that piece of legislation in the United States. Is this is this sustainable, well, both for Canada and the U.S. Really, that's, that's billions upon billions of subsidies for these uh, for these uh, EV plants and uh, other uh, other forms of uh, new green energy, et cetera. What, what, what's your take on all of this? Tony, I, I'm not convinced that the private sector working together with their counterparts globally couldn't come up with better and more cost-effective solutions uh, to address these uh, type of factors. I mean, you know, the EV market is exploding. Nobody knows what it looks like 10 years from now, but it seems to be on a positive trajectory. The infrastructure around it needs to be financed. Certainly, the private sector is, is more than able uh, to, to float these type of investments if they're economically sound. Right. Uh, I think when you see government get involved, that questions whether they were sound in the first place. Um, I'm sure a lot of bankers looked at this project and decided, no, we should let the government pay for this because there's no return on investment for it. So, uh, look, you know, government will continue to do what they do. But I, I'm one that says, let's give the private sector a chance to shine uh, when opportunities like this come along. Yeah, okay. Um, I, I do want to talk about the energy sector as well. I know that's something you follow very closely. And, uh, uh, let's start with uh, Saudi Arabia's latest moves. Uh, uh, they want to sort of de-dollarize uh, the, their transactions a little bit. Uh, does that mean the U.S. currency is in some trouble? Well, I don't think overnight that'll be the case. Uh, I, I saw a recent report that 84% of trade in energy globally is in U.S. dollars. Uh, the question is, do, will we feel it if that goes from 84 to 76? Mm. You know, still a massive majority, but we've never seen that before. So it's going to have some impact. It's going to have some impact on the dollar and other currencies. Uh, I do think at some point, you know, leadership in the U.S. will realize they need to integrate with the emerging East. And that's what we're we're talking about here, Tony. It's not just Saudi Arabia. It's all of the Eastern countries getting together saying, we've grown up now. Uh, now we can do things ourselves. We don't really have to rely on a dependence uh, on the West for capital, for technology, for anything. We can make it work ourselves. So uh, I think that, you know, the risk of the dollar is probably you know, five to 10 years away. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it's drastic, but it is something to watch. 
Yeah, and I think that uh, I, I think you'll agree with me that uh, Saudi Arabia also wanted to send a little bit of a, a political message to Joe Biden uh, that that's a long time coming as well with uh, uh, the leadership of MBS uh, that uh, they did they wanted to show that they can do independent moves, not necessarily in concert with the U.S. We'll talk a little bit more about that because I think that is still an important topic. We're going to take another brief commercial break. 